So our next candidate is a young woman called Valeria Kogan, uh, who comes from Irias High School, which is a foundation comprehensive school in Colwyn Bay in North Wales. And she's applying for Classics Course 2A, which means that she has neither Latin nor Greek, uh, but she wants to study Latin from scratch. Yeah, and she's not doing Classical Civilization A-levels either. She's got critical thinking, history, French, English language, so we will have to establish what her motivation for the course is and, and what kind of background knowledge she'll be bringing. Hi, Lydia, do you want to Hi. come through? You're ready for you. Hi. Do you want to take a seat on the sofa? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm the tutor for um, Classics, Latin and Greek language and literature here. I'm Therese Morgan, I teach Greek and Roman history. I wonder if you could tell me what it is, given that you haven't done classics at school, uh, that's got you interested in the subject? Um, well, the first thing that interested me in the subject was I went to Rome when I was seven. Some parents took me around the Colosseum in the floor and I found that really interesting. And since then they've been reading Greek mythology and stories to me, especially Ovid. And recently been reading Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which I find very interesting. Of those authors that you mentioned, is there one that you've particularly enjoyed? I really enjoy reading Ovid. Okay, what is it about Ovid that you've responded to? Um, just the way that he presents the stories and the way that they all interrelate within the book. And probably the fact that he makes things quite... Um, he matches up parts of the stories, like um, Phaethon, and um, the way he f um, falls, from, falls from the chariot, and Icarus, the way he falls from the sky. They can seem to match up quite well. It's rather a strange poem, isn't it, The Metamorphoses? How did you work out um, an approach to a poem like that? Um, well, I tried to read it a few times over to see the continuity because the first time it didn't really make that much sense. But the second few times it does seem to flow through quite well. Flow through? You mean...? What, what, uh, the unity what, is... Uh, um, the cohesion seems to work a lot better once you've gone through it a couple of times. What cohesion do you find in the poem? Uh, the way that the stories follow on from each other because he mentions Daedalus, um, and his um, inventions of the, uh, the maze for the Minotaur and it flows on to Daedalus on the island and how tr he tried to get off the island. Do you think that the transitions between these stories are always successful? Are they always well affected? They're not always that successful because a lot of the time they're just sitting around and talking about something and then they'll tell a story. So it's not technically that successful but I think that as a whole it does work quite well. What do you think about this notion of the unifying topic of metamorphosis? I think it's a very unusual way to approach the subject. And they do seem to repeat quite a lot, but he seems quite self-conscious about it. Because when, um, I don't remember which character was telling a story, he says, oh, I've already said something like this. So it's as if the poet himself is self-conscious about repeating himself. Why does all of this matter? Why, why should a self-conscious poem about metamorphosis, transitions between different stories, one to another, why should all of that interest us? I think it's quite an unusual way to present it, because he does present it with an element of humour and not with, say, tragedy when somebody turns into something, although some of the stories are very tragic. And it's quite an unusual way to present it, and it gives us an insight into the mythology. <music> On the surface, it's obviously an art museum, and there are romantic paintings and classic paintings together, because there's Icarus here, and then there's classicism. I think it's where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the representation of peasants. But um, when you go a bit deeper, I think it's about how suffering does happen, but you still get on with it because um, Icarus fell and there was a disaster, but the plowman um, didn't think it was an important failure and the ship was sailing calmly on. So things do happen and there is suffering, but it just, <coughs> life goes on really. Who's suffering or what suffering is the poet interested in? Well, it says the first line about suffering, they were never wrong. The old masters, how well they understood this human position. And um, obviously the suffering of um, Icarus when he fell. And also um, the aged, wait waiting for a miraculous birth, that hoping and anticipation of it, but it never really quite happening. But the children didn't particularly want it to happen, so... Is it a particular type of suffering? Um, there is religious suffering. There's the miraculous birth and then there's dreadful martyrdom. But there's other types of suffering, there's the mundane suffering, how it takes place when somebody's eating or opening a window, and also the classical story of Icarus. So what is the mundane suffering? Um, I was guessing it was when somebody's eating or opening a window, just or walking dully along. Without the walking dully along, it would have just been everyday life, but it seems to be quite mundane, banal in the way that the daily grind of things. Could you tell us about particular effects in the poem that you think work well? 
um, just as good if you think they don't work well? Um, well, he doesn't talk about suffering and then um, people going on with their lives. It's kind of juxtaposed within the lines, where one part it says martyrdom, but in another corner the dogs go on with their doggy life. So it kind of leads on from one to the other. And what makes that them. effective? Um, because you keep one in mind while you ex seem to be experiencing the other through the poem. And I like the ending as well, had somewhere to go and sailed calmly on. It reminds me quite a bit of Sylvia Plath and the fact that it does sail calmly on. It does. Okay, um, you say on your new castle that you've been to Rome, you said you've been to Rome in the seventh, and you've uh, been to the Forum, you've had a look at the Colosseum. But I wonder whether you can tell me a bit about what we learn from archaeological sites like these that is different from what we get from literature. The literature doesn't often describe everyday life the way that they lived. Um, you wouldn't know from lots of literature that there are men's quarters and women's quarters in the houses, which you can infer from the archaeology. How can you tell that from the archaeology of a house? Um, what you find in each part, because in some rooms you find looms and pots and other things, and then in other rooms you don't. So mm -hmm. you can find out that that room was for women because women were the ones that weaved. How do you know that women were the ones that wove? from literature, so they complement each other. So they complement each other yes. sometimes. Can you think of anything that you can get from archaeology that you couldn't get from literature? Um, from things like the Forum, you know that everyday life and them, say, visiting temples and gods, it was a very normal thing, like the baths in Rome. They went to the baths, but there was also the prayers that they found there, so they were worshipping while they were doing everyday things. Um, yeah, that's a good example. That's a nice one. You're talking about everyday life. Um, you think the Colosseum, what goes on at the Colosseum is everyday life? In what sense is it everyday life? Uh, it's a form of entertainment. So I guess we see entertainment now as part of everyday life. You work and then you have leisure. And right. they worked and that was their way of having leisure. Um, is that a fair assumption? That because entertainment is part of our everyday lives, it's part of our own everyday lives? Not necessarily because they'd only celebrate festivals and things. So they'd see plays, but they'd do so only at festivals. Right. Um, Colosseum, of course, doesn't put on literary festivals. Yes. You're thinking of theatres mm -hmm. and something like Great Dinosaur in Classical Athens. Uh, what does the Colosseum put on? Do you know very much about um, what's going on there? About gladiators and yeah. um, fighting and reacting battles. Yeah, all those things. Yeah, wild beast fights and gladiatorial contests. And uh, the Colosseum could be flooded and could have a, um, ships on it. Um, Everyday life? Any sense of how often this sort of thing happens? Um, I'm not quite sure. I doubt that it really happened that often. What about the Forum? What did you learn from walking around the Forum from the archaeological remains? Oh, not very much because they've taken a lot of marble away from the Vatican, I don't know. Um, but I've just found out about Vestal Virgins and Human Flame, which I quite like that story and idea of it. Right, Temple um, of Vesta. Yeah. Right. Um, is this um, expected, unexpected? I mean, what is what what is the forum? I mean, it's it a thing in the temple. What else is it? Uh, wasn't a marketplace, mar marketplace mm -hmm. and um, where leaders could make speeches to the people. Mm-hmm. Um, and are there actually physical remains that fit with that? Um, there was a balcony in one of the buildings. I think one of the Caesars was too close to the people, and then they didn't quite like that. Right. Um. Uh. I think you're thinking of the Senate House. Yes. So on the table here, uh, you've got a little scrap of paper uh, with a printed picture on it. I wonder if you can just lean over and have a look at that for me. And tell me what you see and what you can deduce about it. It, um, it looks very much like things associated with Christmas, like the baubles and the acorns. Right, um, okay. I guess the crowd would get them crackers, don't you? I'm not entirely sure the significance of that. Well, think about it. What's the connection between Christmas and crowns? Um, something to do with Constantine um, putting on, um, trying to unite Rome through Christianity, maybe? That's my first guess. Could be. That's, um, that's, I think, probably cleverer than the people who made this were intended. <laughs> um, I think you a more general connection between Would Christmas it be the kings or the three wise men? Ah, the three yeah. wise men or the three kings. Okay, so we're not talking strictly about Christmas then, but... Um, the birth of Jesus. Okay, what else is going on? Um, there's a candle and some sort of pie, so some right. sort of special food that's associated with the epiphany. That's exactly what it is. It's actually a French cake called a galette de roi, and that's the bag it comes in. They print them specially. 
All right, okay. Okay, Valeria, thank you very much. Um, before we finally uh, wind up, is there anything you'd like to ask us about the course or... Um, uh, the college or anything yeah. like that? Um, nothing I can think yeah. of at the moment. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks you. so much for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's good that she would had read those things, which she clearly read um, the metamorphosis and, and enjoyed it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Uh, she was thinking about some important formal, formal questions about coherence and, and transitions, um, uh, gave a hint of some um, really quite suggestive things and a, a tragedy within, within this poem and self-consciousness. Um, she obviously loves to read and one of the remarkable things about her UCAS form um, is the amount that she talks about that she reads for Plato. I mean, she reads Pushkin, Plato and... Yeah. <coughs> Voltaire and Nietzsche for and she's a, and she's, she's a voracious she's, reader. She's, she's, a published, she's a published poet, um, yeah. so it's a, it's a bit, <coughs> it's a little bit disappointing that she, that, she, that she wasn't better on, mm. uh, on poetic techniques and, and uh, effects and language. On the other hand, actually, she was surprisingly strong on the history. I mean, she does modern history A-level, but she doesn't have any ancient history in her background. Um, and yet, actually, she knew quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, when she began to think about it. Good, and she yeah. was very good to respond to, you know, a suggestion that would take her in a different direction, a mm. new idea. She thought about it and said, oh, yes, OK, then that would follow. You mm. know, she was very responsive, yeah. actually, very, clearly very teachable, uh, which was um, very mm. encouraging. I thought her strongest point of all was on, um, was on the image. Yeah, um, she immediately could just, I mean, she just could just see what was going on. Yeah. And actually, it's surprisingly difficult to look at an image and see what's there. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a diff difficult image, but she, she, she um, Took picked it up apart. The, Im the imagery very, very quickly. And it's a good UCAS form in general. She's got a few A stars, a lot of A's at GCSE, um, A grades predicted at A level. So that looks very solid, very strong reference from the school. Um, and her two essays uh, were very interesting, weren't they? Um, just, you know, two very different topics, interesting ideas mm -hmm. coming through, a bit unformed, but, but looks promising, which is the best one can decent, decent, yeah. So I think definitely in, in definitely play, a, pros a prospect. Yeah, yeah. yeah.